Hey folks, Doug Blake with Body Design University. In this video, I'm going to help you to understand uh, one of the five deviations, deviation number four, which is the shoulder position and thoracic spine deviation. This is in chapter 10, the muscular, uh, muscular training. These are the assessments. Now, arguably, chapter 10 is one of the more um, perhaps one of the most important chapters in the entire textbook. And I'm not saying just from information perspective, great information, but also from a testing perspective. So <clears throat> ACE is going to tell you that there are five sort of common, and we use the word common, you can put it in quotes, but common postural deviations that you will probably at some point or another in your career as a trainer, you're going to see people coming in with. Um, and so deviation number four uh, shoulder position and the thoracic spine is one that is, uh, you'll probably see this just from my experience, uh, even more so than some of the others. But before I before I get started, if any of the videos that um, that I've done prior to this video and this video in particular, if any of them have been of benefit to you, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel. Uh, it would be very helpful and much appreciated. So let me get back to deviation number four. Now, this this is on page 402, but the, the deviations themselves start back on, well, the general area that you obviously are going to need to know is on 394. Figure 10.3 gives you some uh, really important information. And then as you move through the chapter, you're going to get to page 397, common postural deviations. And it says addresses five key postural deviations. You'll read through those again in this video. I'm just going to go over deviation number four. So this is shoulder position and the thoracic spine. A couple of things to keep in mind as you're going through this particular area and to help you understand it is that they give you a lot of figures. They're giving you lots of pictures so you can understand and appreciate uh, the, actual, the actual issue that people are dealing with. Remember, ultimately, these deviations are going to stem generally from muscle imbalances. What's causing the muscle imbalance? You, you and I both know what's causing most of this, and that's just poor posture due to like we're doing right, like I'm doing right here, right? I'm rounded shoulders. I'm at a computer. I'm looking, my entire life is sitting in front of. Well, of course, I'm going to develop muscle imbalances if I'm not careful, and this is what we see with the average client that comes in. Oh, we see, by the way, we see this one significant. I, I've always seen this with pretty much every client I've ever dealt with, um, even athletes to a greater extent. But deviation number four on page 402, a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, yes, look at the pictures. Try and understand the scapula movements that, they, that they've notated for you. But one of the other really important things to keep in mind, especially from a testing perspective, are the bolded terms that you're gonna see here, especially at the bottom of page 402. The first one is known as the scapulohumeral rhythm. Um, and it gives you, you know, this specific two degrees of humeral motion, meaning the, the humerus, right? The upper arm bone, uh, one degree of scapula motion. Now, now keep in mind, the scapula can move up and down. Um, it can, uh, sort of ad abduct and adduct, meaning that it can slide across the rib cage. It can also rotate. And generally, those three movement patterns associated also with the movement of the of the upper arm bone is what we what we call scapulohumeral uh, rhythm. And um, the idea is that when you're moving your arm, you, if you look at my shoulder joint, yeah, my shoulder joint is going through flexion extension, but you don't see the scapula, you don't see the backbone rotating and moving and mo doing all these um, uh, patterns of motion that are allowing my arm to do different things. In other words, without the scapula, without that, that basic mechanical complex right there, I would have very limited motion in my arm. I wouldn't be able to uh, protract and retract. And that's kind of the idea. Now, just keep in mind, understanding basic kinesiological functions is a part uh, is a part of going through this material. Because if you look, uh, figure, figure 1013, scapular movements, you got to know these by heart. So in other words, 
uh, deviation number four requires that you understand uh, that the scapula elevates, goes up, right? And you can see the picture of it. And the exact opposite of elevation is depression. So elevation, depression, adduction, which is re what we call it retraction. I never used, I've never used the, the term adduction, but ACE uses it. It's always retraction. That's when you squeeze your shoulder blades together in the back. We call that retraction. And the opposite of retraction is protraction. Now that's the shoulder girdle. And when we're talking about the scapula, just the scapula, which is part of the entire shoulder girdle, the scapula then has the terms adduction and abduction. And that's simply movement. You can see the arrows when you're looking at this figure. So the arrows show the scapula, scapulae moving closer to the spinal column or moving further away from the spinal column. Adduction is when um, the, the bone or body segment moves closer to the midline of the body, which is why retraction is called also scapula adduction. As the scapula move away from the spinal column through what we call protraction, you can see how my shoulders are moving forward. Well, that's, that involves movement of the scapulae away from the spinal, spinal column. Movement away from the midline of the body or the spinal column is known as ab or abduction, hence the term. Abduction, adduction, retraction, protraction. Then we have what's known as rotation. And so the scapulae can actually, as it sits here, and you can see the picture, is it can rotate, right? And you'll see upward versus downward rotation. And again, you just look at the position. You know, if I'm up here like this, the the lower part or the inferior aspect of my scapula rotates outward. So if you see my look at me this way, my scapula are in front here. When the when the inferior, the lower aspect of the scapulae rotate outward this way, that is called upward rotation. That's what they're saying, upward rotation. And then downward rotation is when the scapulae go back to their normal stabilized position. Um, of course, page 402 at the bottom. Yes, read through this. You can read through this, but the scapulohumeral rhythm is the key concept from this particular page right here. Figure 1011. Okay, look, I'm not saying you're going to get any questions on the four different actual joints uh, related to the scapula or the four articulations, but it's not a bad idea. Grab yourself a pad or a pencil. And, and by the way, just so you know, um, in studying this for many years, what, what is always uh, interesting is that it's not difficult to memorize a lot of this material because the words or the position or the placement of a particular uh, anatomical structure has, has the very name in it. So look at the four articulations in figure 1011, sternoclavicular. Well, what are the what's what are the two what are the two components that are coming together? Sterno, sternum. So you already know it's the sternum, and clavicular, the clavicle. Okay, it's I don't think I don't think that that's too challenging. The sternoclavicular joint is what? It's where the clavicle meets the sternum. Really pretty straightforward, I would think. How about the acromio? clavicular joint. Now you all know this one because that's the AC joint, right? So the uh, um the sternoclavicular sternum clavicular, the clavicle, that's that bone right there, right? Now that's the sternoclavicular joint. All I got to do is go straight out across the clavicle bone to the what's known as the acromion process. That is the acromioclavicular joint. That's where most people have issues and problems. Uh, I had mine removed about 30 years ago due to a training uh, training issue I had, and they literally cut out the distal component of my clavicle because it was scraping and rubbing up, uh, but that's another story. So the acromioclavicular joint is the uh, is the clavicle, which is the bone up here, and the, acromio, uh, the acromion process. The scapulothoracic joint, scapula, the scapula, thoracic, which is the rib cage itself, 
So for the most part, it's where the scapula comes against the rib cage. That is the scapulothoracic joint or articulation. Yeah, it's probably not proper to say joint. And then there's the glenohumeral, the glenoid, right? Or the glenoid fossa inside the scapula. So if you look at the scapula, it actually has this little groove. Now we call this, we call this the shoulder joint. That's the shoulder joint. That's the that's that little groove, right? The glenoid fossa. That's this little groove, this little shelf that allows the head of the humerus to sit in. And that's the shoulder joint. And you can see that obviously in this picture. Let me see if they got a better picture of it. No. And so that's your shoulder joint. You can see on figure 10, 11. So it's a good idea to memorize those. They're not difficult to memorize. Sterno, sternum, clavicular, clavicle, gleno, glenoid, right? On the, on the, on the, on the scapula, the outer aspect of the scapula bone itself. So what do you need to know? Figure 10, 11, know those four articulations, 10, 12, scapulohumeral rhythm. This is a good one to know. And again, how do you memorize this stuff? Rewrite it. It's not, it's not that difficult. Movement of the arm is accompanied by movement of the scapula, a ratio of approximately uh, two, two degrees of arm movement for every one degree of scapula movement. So every two degrees of movement of my arm li like this. So if I move my arm total of 90 degrees, my scapula basically rotates upward, upward about 45 degrees, a total of 45 degrees of movement. Why? Because it's a two to one ratio. And so that's the, that's the deal with shoulder abduction or shoulder flexion. So it's not exactly like that, but it's, it's close enough. And so that's what you're going to see on page uh, 403. Uh, figure 10 for the normal position of the scapulae. So again, you're getting some terminology. Medial border of the scapula is what's closest to the spinal column. The head of the humerus. I'm, I'm not really sure why they put the muscle over it, but that's covering it up. And then of course the inferior angle. Remember, remember the terms inferior below, superior above. Medial is closer to the midline of the body. Lateral Medial, lateral, right lateral is further away. So you do technically have a lateral border or lateral aspect to the scapula, but go by what they give you. So 1014, I'm at the page of 404, illustrates the resting position. So it's a great question that can be asked. What is the resting position or the follow all the following would be considered the resting position of the scapula, right? Um, and they would give you a list of possible, you know, possible positions. Um, and that would be a great, that would be a great uh, question. You should know that. Okay. So uh, the apply what you know box 404 scapular winging and scapular protraction. This is a great piece of information to know. And yes, they will be more than likely going to ask you a question. It's probably going to come from one of these, one of these areas. So this the apply what you know box, very important. And they're going to reference the uh, the table, which is of prime importance as well, which is the shoulder position table. Now, here's what I want you to keep in mind when you're going through this uh, deviation number four. This table right here is your go-to memorization table. Because once you get back here, you're going to be going into deviation five. So you're going to get here. This is where, and you'll notice this didn't take a whole lot of time to read through and study. Okay. Shoulder position, your observation, shoulders are not level. And they give you great pictures. These figures help you to understand exactly what you're seeing in table 10.8. Now, from a memorization perspective, I try not to waste a whole lot of time on what appears to me to be common sense. The point of view column, probably common sense. Uh, so I'm not going to worry about that. But my observation is that the shoulders are not level. Now here it is: tight muscles, lengthened muscles. This is a this is a key component to the chapter, a key component to the, the this fourth fourth deviation, which is which muscles are tight, shortened, overactive, whatever name you want to use for it, and they will use multiple terms: tight, shortened, okay overactive. These are terms that you might see on the test. 
Okay, so if a muscle is tight and short and it's going to pull, it's going to pull a bone, whatever, articulation out of proper resting position. And that's all they're giving you here. If you see that the shoulders are not level, probably what we're seeing are, are tight upper trapezi trapezius muscles, tight levator scapula, which you can't see, but the levator scapula is probably the, the main, one of the main muscles that elevates the scapula, right? So we're talking about this movement like this um, and rhomboids on the elevated side. So shoulders are not level, simply meaning that when you look at a client and they're like this, you got a problem, right? That means that that trapezius levator scapula, probably the rhomboids as well are going to be um, tight, overactive, shortened on that side. Pretty straightforward. Asymmetry to midline. Now, what does that mean? Asymmetry to midline simply means that one side is more protracted or retracted than the other side. Okay. Asymmetry to midline, meaning to the spinal column. Simply that easiest way to do that is to go back to page 403 and kind of look at the look at the adduction protraction, um, adduction, retraction, abduction, protraction picture, and imagine that the scapulae one is closer to the spine than the other. That's all that means. That's called asymmetry to midline, and that could be caused by lateral trunk flexors. Your goal is just to memorize that. Just memorize that that is the muscle suspected to be overactive or tight or shortened. Uh, protracted, medially rotated humerus. Medially mean internally rotated humerus. Kyphosis, right? What is kyphosis, right? That is an over-exaggeration of the normal kyphotic curve associated with the thoracic spine. So T1 through T12 is generally in this curve, what we call a kyphotic curve. Kyphotic curves are normal. Um, lordotic curves, which are the uh, opposite uh, concavity, are normal. It's when they are over-exaggerated that we, we notice that there are problems. So <clears throat> when the kyphotic curve is over-kyphotic, we call it kyphosis, okay? Um, lordosis. So kyphosis is when the normal kyphotic curve, especially in the thoracic spine, that normal kyphotic curve is over-exaggerated due to what? Muscle imbalances in some way, shape, or form. Tightened muscles, lengthened, weakened, um, shortened, lengthened muscles. So kyphosis and depressed chest, shoulder, and what are the muscles suspected to be tight? Yeah, you just gotta, just gotta memorize it. Um, and so they throw a muscle in there, the serratus anterior right here. So if that's tight, it pulls the scapula into protraction. It's one of the reasons why we know folks that have been sitting at tables on watch, put my elbows up front here. It's going to shorten my serratus anterior. It's going to shorten my uh, pectoralis minor, all these muscles. If you start to see the mechanics of it, mechanically, it really starts to make sense. And you'll be able to, you'll be able to know just like that, which muscles are suspected of being tight and which muscles, the opposing muscles, kinesiologically uh, opposing those muscles um, are going to be lengthened or weak. And of course that takes care of table 10.8. Uh, look, if, if this was a helpful video, please type the word understand in the comment section below. Uh, if you want full access, Here's, here's the key. If you want full access to all of the ACE exam uh, materials in our exam prep course, every chapter has its, has its own uh, video associated with it, uh, audio text, quizzes, practice exams. What else we got? We've got Quizlet study sets specific for each, each chapter. Please go ahead, click on the link in the description below. And once again, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Um, the notification bell is helpful because we put material out on a regular basis. You do not want to miss it. Also, keep in mind, every Wednesday night, uh, we conduct what's known as Quizlet Live. And if you've never used Quizlet, that's a problem because it's a great study tool. So that's number one. But you might have used Quizlet but never did Quizlet Live. And Quizlet Live is a whole nother level of engagement and interaction because we create 
um, an actual competitive environment. So you can come in virtually and play Quizlet live and um, you can actually win the game, maybe even win $50, but it's quick. It's 30 minutes. It's 6 p.m. Eastern time every Wednesday night. You heard that Eastern time, six Eastern, five Central, four Mountain, three Pacific. So wherever you live, make sure you get those times right. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye.